Hello and welcome to Stand in the Gap. I'm Sam Rohr and I'm going to be joined again today by Pastor Isaac Crockett. Now if you've watched this program before, you may be aware that on this program we identify and address what we refer to as transcending cultural issues, those significant issues that dominate our culture are most often controversial, and those issues that have been around uh, generally for a long time, but seem to have no answer. Those issues we choose are of themselves generally large enough to destroy our nation from within. They're often issues purposely exploited by ideological enemies who oppose God, oppose a biblical worldview and freedom as we've known it in America. Now, in the last few programs, we've covered such issues as defending life uh, versus abortion and the other destroyers of life. We've talked about Islam in America and how Christians should respond to the religion and the political system of Islam, as well as the individual Muslim who lives next door or with whom we interface in the workplace. A third recent two-part program focused on spiritual deception within the American church and how Marxism and Islam is infiltrating the Evangelical Church in America. Now today on Stand in the Gap, along with special guest Ken Ham, who's the founder and the CEO of Answers in Genesis, will address the alarming and serious problem that the core essence of Western culture itself is on life support. Now if you haven't noticed it, Western culture is under severe attack, and it has been for well over a generation, with an increasingly aggressive undermining of the very pillars of the Judeo-Christian worldview, which underpins our concept of self-government, free enterprise, private property rights, the concept of equality before the law, or that the law is above the king, not the king above the law, and that all rights come from God, not government, or that God is Creator, Judge, King, and Redeemer, all of these things, they're all found rooted in a biblical world view of life, and they're being undermined. This view of God, articulated by our early Pilgrim and Puritan fathers, was inculcated into our children, preached from our pulpits, and integrated into our law. And it's this world view that defended the world against tyrants and despots who sought to subjugate the world and to murder millions of people in not just two previous world wars, but even an ongoing war right now that unfortunately most people are unaware. Now in the next two programs, we'll identify the issue, the problem, the cause, and the solution as to how and why Western culture is on life support. And in this program, part one, we'll look at the church in, uh, in, in America and the Western world. In part two next week, we'll examine the family in America and the Western world, and why it's also fighting for its life, and how we got to this point, and the solution to our trouble. Now to walk into this key issue will be Ken Ham, again, founder and CEO of Answers in Genesis. Ken's an author, speaker, Christian apologist for biblical truth, and the visionary behind the Creation Museum and the Ark Experience located in Northern Kentucky. And with that, let me welcome to our program right now, Mr. Ken Ham. Ken, thank you for being with us again on the program. Hey, thanks, Sam. It's great to be with you again. Uh, Ken, uh, you've been on our program before, and uh, you, a lot of our people recognize Ken Ham, and they certainly probably have been to the Ark, uh, as well as I've been, quite an experience. Uh, we got a big topic to get into right now. Uh, you and us, Isaac and I, we share a biblical worldview, uh, understanding of absolute truth. Uh, but I'd like to define terms, Ken, before we get into the discussion. I'd like you to define right now, before we go into this matter of Western culture and the church being fighting for its life, being on uh, uh, life support, define Western culture so we have a handle on that, and then define the church as we're going to talk about it in this program today. Well, in summary, of course, you know, you could talk about geographically that uh, Western culture uh, consists of parts of uh, Europe and then the Americas and Australasia. But we're also talking about, you know, those countries that have been greatly affected by many influences, but particularly, say, the Reformation. And there's been a tremendous Christian influence uh, in this area that we would call the West. And so the West has sort of had 
a, a Christianized worldview permeating through it based on the Judeo-Christian ethic. And, you know, when it comes to the church, to define the church, uh, a lot of people, when they think of church, would think of, oh, you know, our local church or our Baptist or Presbyterian or Methodist church. But actually, when you look in the Bible, the church, I mean, talking about that Greek word from which uh, we get that, uh, you know, people called out, meaning those who are God's people uh, all over the earth. In fact, the Bible refers to the church as the bride of Christ. He doesn't have different brides. He only has one bride. And one day he's coming back for his bride. The foundation of the church is Jesus Christ, and he's the chief cornerstone of the temple of God. And And those of us whose foundation is Jesus Christ are stones in that temple of God. So all of those who are true Bible-believing Christians are really part of the church. And, you know, it's interesting today, people might say, oh, well, I go to Baptist church, Presbyterian church. But, you know, in those early days of Christianity, uh, you know, as a result of uh, the apostles and so on, people referred to a church as, oh, the Church of Smyrna or the Church of Laodicea. It was a place, uh, not a particular name. But I think that it's all important for us to understand the church is the body of Christ worldwide. That's excellent, Ken. Thank you very much. And ladies and gentlemen, stay with us. We're going to come back right now. We're going to get right into the discussion. And I'm going to be asking Ken his opinion on to what degree is the church in America and the Western world in trouble? Is it fighting for its life? And I want him to define the problem. We're going to do that right next. Truth, flexible or permanent? The Bible, ancient history or powerfully relevant? Culture, a reflection of enlightenment or warning signs? The pastor, commentator or frontline combatant? Every day, American Pastors Network speaks to these questions where and when they matter. With hundreds of affiliate radio stations nationwide, a website and mobile app screening today's headlines through the twin lenses of the Bible and the Constitution. Educating, informing, equipping. This is the American Pastors Network. The time is now to stand in the gap for truth. Well, welcome back to Stand in the Gap. In our theme today, we're talking about the, the Western world fighting for its life, and specifically the church. And uh, Ken, uh, I want to go back to you here right now. At the American Pastors Network, we deal with pastors. We try to lift up the authority of Scripture, but we do know that the church in America, at least, and you can take it more broadly beyond that if you want, has been in real trouble. George Barna, a friend of ours, I think a friend of yours as well, uh, probably one of the best researchers, uh, a, two years ago, indicated that less than 30% of those in the pulpits of America, these even include evangelical churches, even believe in the authority of Scripture. So that being the case, we know, by extension, that most churches are not really addressing the issues of the day. We've got a problem. From your research, Ken, and as you travel the country and, and all, um, to what degree do you believe that the church in America and the church in the Western world, if you want to go as we've defined it, uh, is fighting for its life uh, right now? To what degree is it on life support? And then I want you to define the problem, th define the problem as you see it with the modern church. Well, Sam, there's a, a lot of things that we could say here, but... You know, if you think about it, uh, as Christians, we're to be light and salt and we're to impact the culture and we're to go into all the world and to preach the gospel. And there's no doubt that the church has impacted our Western world in a big way, uh, you know, in the past. And as I said, you know, the effect of the Reformation and so on. I mean, even if you take America, uh, generations ago, when you consider, say, the greatest generation and then the silent generation, the baby boomers. I mean, even those who weren't Christian tended to have more of a Christianized worldview, you know, that uh, abortion was wrong, it was killing a human being, that marriage was a man and a woman, certainly not two men. But when you look at the younger generations, generation X, Y, and Z, you see that they are much more secularized. And, 
there's been an exodus from the church uh, with, say, the millennials. When you look at Generation Y, two-thirds of them have been leaving the church since uh, college age, and very few of those are returning. And so when you look at the state of the church in regard to all of this, you know, 56% of the greatest generation, uh, they're the D-Day generation, they went to church. And then you get progressively less and less as you come down through the silent and then the baby boomers, uh, it's just over 30%. You get down to the millennials, only 18% go to church. And then we get to Generation Z, and George Barner has done some research with Generation Z. They're the younger generation, so not as much information available uh, about them. But when you look at them, they're twice as likely to be atheist as any previous generation, and they are the first truly, as George Barner calls them, post-Christian generation. So then we've got to stand back and have a look and say, so we're seeing an exodus from the church. So the church is decreasing in its impact on the culture. And we're seeing the younger generations very secularized. And actually, you know, when you even consider the a political scene in America right now, some of the battles that we see are really, if you like, uh, battles between the older generations that are more Christianized and that is the greatest, the silent, and the baby boomers, and then generation X, Y, and Z that are much more secularized. And I would say that it's really the church's fault, because when you look at the fact uh, that church attendance was so much greater in the past, it's not now. We have to ask ourselves, what happened? Why did the church allow this to happen? And I'd say in summary, to put it this way, the church, the body of Christ, God's people, should be impacting the culture. But I believe we've allowed the culture to impact and invade the church. And that's really what's happened. You know, and Ken, uh, it's so sad to see this happening because the church has the power right there. We have God's word, the truth, and all that we need is right there in the word of God. And it hasn't been used. But we know if we go to the Bible, the Bible has the answers for everything, for every issue we're going through. And that's what we appreciate so much about your ministry at Answers in Genesis. Right from the very beginning of God's Word, uh, God makes it clear, His expectations and what we need to be doing. And so I'd like to go to you and ask you as kind of a detective, uh, Detective Ken here, if you were to look for the root cause, what's, what's caused this? How did we get to this place? I mean, you've kind of talked historically and gone through generationally some of the, the slippery slope, if you would. But what would you say uh, from your research would be maybe the cause for the position the church is in right now? Well, you know, it's interesting. Uh, a number of years ago, for instance, uh, there was a movement, for, uh, for instance, within the Southern Baptist uh, to turn it back to a more conservative evangelical uh, group and to get away from liberalism that was invading uh, much of the church. And there was a, a, an interesting statement put out, you know, the statement of inerrancy, the Chicago statement of inerrancy that many uh, Christian leaders signed. But when you look at that particular statement, even though it sounds like a statement standing on the authority of God's word, it, when it came to Genesis, it left it open so that people could question the days of creation or, you know, allow for millions of years and so on. And one of the things that I have said is that no matter how many people sign that, if you don't shut the door right there in Genesis, because there's been an incredible attack on the authority of God's word beginning in Genesis in this day and age. And if we don't shut the door beginning in Genesis, uh, we're going to see the undermining of the authority of the word of God, and you'll see the church going down that same road again, drifting away uh, from the authority of God's word. And I believe that has happened. You know, in 2 Corinthians 11, 3, we're warned that the devil is going to use the same method on us as he did on Eve to get us to a position of not believing the word of God. And the method he used on Eve in Genesis 3, 1 was this, did God really say, in other words, doubting the word of God, and you can become like God. In other words, you can be your own God. And that's exactly what has happened in this day. There's been a particular attack on the authority of the word of God beginning in Genesis. And most churches, most Christian leaders have capitulated. And just recently, a really good practical example, just recently, 
uh, uh, the uh, president of a very large uh, Protestant denomination uh, in the United States came out with a podcast and said that it didn't really matter what you believed about the six days and, you know, whether you believed in six literal days, young earth and so on, that that's not a what what's called a first tier issue. Mm. Uh, you know, uh, for instance, you know, if you don't believe Jesus Christ rose from the dead, well, you know, that's obviously a first tier issue, right? But six days, young earth, and so on, is not a first tier issue, supposedly. So then I wrote an article on this and I said, okay, does the Bible tell us you have to believe Jesus walked on water uh, to be saved? Well, actually, it doesn't. In fact, you could go through and list a lot of things. Does the Bible tell us you have to believe Jesus uh, healed the blind, that he fed 5,000 people, uh, that, as I said, he walked on water? Or does it say you have to believe in the virgin birth to be saved? But so does it matter whether you believe those things? And we would say, of course it matters. It matters because that's the word of God. Well, that's the point. So is biblical authority a first tier issue when it comes to these things? In other words, is it important to believe in biblical authority? And the answer is absolutely yes. And when you look at that, and th this is sort of a summary of the issue, I think. A summary of the issue would be this, that when you look at, uh, at, at what's going on in our churches, I, I had a Presbyterian minister interviewing me on radio, and he said, now you agree we can believe in uh, you know, different modes of baptism, sprinkling, immersion, there's different views of Sabbath day, there's different views of eschatology and so on within the church, uh, different views of speaking in tongues, and I said that's true. And he said, and there's different views of Genesis, same thing. I said, no, it's not. Because if you think about it, when people are talking about eschatology or baptism uh, or Sabbath day, they're looking at scripture. This scripture says this, but this says this, this says this. Obviously, somebody's wrong. But nonetheless, they're arguing from scripture primarily. But when you go to Genesis, the reason they have different views, they're taking ideas outside of scripture, taking them to scripture, to reinterpret scripture, ideas of evolution or millions of years, reinterpreting the days, reinterpreting the account in Genesis, and that is undermining the authority of the word of God. And that's the key to understanding what's happened in the Western world in the uh, recent times, in our era, particularly since the 1700s, that the church started adopting ideas outside of scripture and reinterpreting Genesis. The majority of our Christian leaders will not take a stand on a literal Genesis. The majority of our seminaries, Bible colleges do not. And that's where we lost biblical authority. And until the church understands that and wakes up to that, you know, we've got generations that have come through the church being told, you can believe what you taught at school about evolution millions of years, doesn't matter, just trust in Jesus. Now we see there's an exodus from the church. They weren't taught to defend their faith, weren't taught answers to the skeptical questions. And now they doubted the word of God. And as uh, as Paul tells us in 2 Corinthians 11, 3, that doubt leads to unbelief, the same method that Satan used on Eve and now we see this exodus from the church. So, That's what I mean by the culture invading the church. That, that is so true. And I love how you walked us through that biblically, just real quickly here in the couple of moments we have left. Um, again, kind of as a detective, as somebody who has researched this, you've written on this, which do you think happened first? You said that the church is not impacting culture, instead culture is impacting the church. Do you think it was the churches and the seminaries that started to go downhill first, or the culture declined and brought the church with it, or, or maybe something else? Well, you know, when you look in the scripture, you know, you know, we read that scripture, there's nothing new under the sun. And there really is nothing new under the sun. Uh, in Jesus' day, it was the church uh, leaders or, you know, the, the religious leaders, I should say, uh, who were leading the people astray. If you look in the days of the prophets, it was the leaders who were leading people astray. And I believe what has happened, I, I, I think, you know, there's a number of aspects to it all. But first of all, our seminaries and Bible colleges, our academia, our leaders, compromise God's word in Genesis and taught generations of pastors, it doesn't matter what you believe about Genesis, just go out there and tell people, you know, trust in Jesus to be saved. The people in the church didn't judge what they were being taught against the word of God. And fathers gave up 
uh, their responsibility to train their children at home and left it to the church. So you put all those issues together and you have a disaster right now in our Western world in regard to the church and what's happening in our culture. That is fascinating. And uh, it, it just it's a multifaceted uh, place that we've come to. And again, I want to go back to Scripture, and I just I want to thank you for being on with us. We have we're going to come right back and go, you know, look at some of these answers with you real quickly here. But we know that Scripture does have the answers all the way from the very beginning to the very end. These answers are here, and we want to get into uh, those answers. I, if you're watching as you're watching right now, don't be discouraged, don't despair, because God's Word tells us what we need to know and what we need to do right now. So we're going to take a short break. And we're going to come back and look at some of the answers for going forward from where we're at. Stand in the Gap is produced and recorded in the studios of WBPH Philadelphia, positively different television. So is the Western world on life support? Yes, it is. We're talking about that today. Is the church in America on life support? The answer is yes. The problem, as Ken Ham, our guest, uh, just talked about, really, it's been the departure of our belief in the authority of Scripture. And then when that leaves, then everything begins to happen. That brings us now to a point, Ken, where I want you to take and bring this discussion where we talked about the church. Uh, to a point where we've had, all right, we have a problem. You talked about the cause. You're very clear on that. Let's talk about a solution now. Because are we doomed to only being where we are right now? Is the church forever now in a point of malaise? Or is there a return? Can we see a strengthening? What does God's Word say about the church and what the church needs to do in a time like we're seeing today? Well, you know, I've um, often listened to sermons by, say, Martin Lloyd-Jones and uh, read uh, articles dealing with, you know, revival in the past, because we've seen revivals in various places uh, in history. And one of the things that I would say as, is, is this, you can't have a revival without what I would call uh, a reformation, a new reformation. If you think about the reformation, it was really a call to the church to return to the authority of the word of God. And what I believe is we need a new reformation to call the church back to the authority of the word of God. You know, the church right now is sort of like many Christians in the culture. Many, many Christians in the culture look at issues like gay marriage, abortion, racism as the problems in the culture. But they're not the problems, they're the symptoms of the problem. The problem is a foundational issue that people are building their uh, worldview on man's word, not God's word. And, you know, in the church, uh, people are trying to deal with the symptoms in the sense of, oh, we're losing young people from the church. What do we do? So they, you know, increase the music and increase the entertainment and uh, that sort of thing. And what has happened is the church, in a way, has become very secularized. What I say is this our generations need answers. They need to know they can trust the Bible. In fact, we have people today in the younger generations don't know what the Bible is. In fact, when you ask most of the older generation, explain what the Bible is, where it came from. How do you know it's the word of God? How do you answer these skeptical questions that undermine God's word? There's been an incredible lack of teaching of apologetics in our churches mm -hmm. and a lack of teaching foundationally. In other words, the Bible is not just a guidebook to life. It's not just a book you add to your thinking. Genesis 1 to 11 is the foundation for all of our doctrine, for marriage, for having the right worldview in regard to abortion or dealing with racism or why you wear clothes, uh, with everything, the whole gospel. 
And until the church understands that they need a worldview based on God's word, based on Genesis 1 to 11, and therefore know what they believe and why they believe what they do, and equipped with answers to the skeptical questions that attack and undermine God's word in today's world, the church is not going to be effective. And there we have it. And Ken, thank you for being with us today. Ladies and gentlemen, we're at the end of our program. This is part one. Join us next week as we talk about the family also in crisis. But you heard the issue today. Foundationally, if you're watching and you're part of the bride of Christ, you are part of the solution. We are part of the solution. Let's regain our foothold on the Word of God, stand on the truth, and live it out as God intends. Thank you for watching and communicate with us this week. If you are being, being blessed by this program, let us know that you are being blessed by Stand in the Gap. Partner with us in prayer. Partner with us in your finances so that the truth can continue on this program. God bless you.